All right, good morning, everyone. So, uh, let's see here. So let's start off with admitting more people. There we go. <laughs> so let's share my screen. Uh, so uh, one announcement. So this morning I posted the uh, solutions for exam five examples. So those are now posted. So now you can work on those and then check your solutions and see how all that's going. Um, otherwise, so let's continue with talking about what we talked about yesterday. So basically we have the mirror equation. So when we start talking about spherical mirrors, so again, we have concave and convex. Concave is the one where the light is going into, so think of it as a cave, you're going inside of a cave. Uh, convex is when the back of that is towards you. <clears throat> um, so the mirror equation says that one over the object distance plus one over the image distance is equal to one over the focal length. And then the lateral magn magnification, I can speak, uh, is equal to the image height divided by the object height, which is also equal to negative of the image distance divided by the object distance. So notice that one thing I didn't point out yesterday, but I'll do that now, uh, is the mirror equation also works for plane mirrors. So remember for plane mirrors, we said that the object distance is equal to negative of the image distance. So it just means it's on the backside and that the object height was exactly equal to the image height, which means the magnification is simply equal to one. So the reason for this is that plane mirror is simply a spherical mirror with a radius equal to infinity. Okay, so if I had a, a sphere and I blow up the radius into infinity, then it just becomes a flat line. So that's a plane. So in that case, we know that the radius is equal to twice of the focal length, which means the focal length is also equal to infinity. So in that case, you have one over the object distance plus one over the Im image distance is equal to one over infinity, but one over infinity is simply equal to zero. So that means that your object distance is equal to a negative of the image distance and then the magnification is simply equal to one. So the plane mirror is embedded inside of the spherical mirror itself. Okay. So let's use all of this and do a couple examples first. And then we'll move on to talk about other things. So my first example is example number two, here it is says we have a 1.5 centimeter tall diamond ring is placed 20 centimeters from a concave mirror with a radius of curvature of 30 centimeters. So it wants to determine the position of the image, so that image distance, and what is its size. So basically the magnification, but then figure out the image height from there. Oh good, so let's kind of draw what's going on first. So we have a concave mirror, so I have black here, good. So here's my concave mirror. So again, concave means we're going inside. So this is my principal axis. So here, this is the radius of curvature, which means this is the focal point. So we know that our focal length is equal to 15 centimeters, because that's equal to one half of the radius of curvature. Um, what else do we know? So we know that the object is placed, where was that number two, there it is. Um, so we know the height, the object height is 1.5 centimeters and it's 20 centimeters in front of it. Okay. So let me go back to my picture. So that means it's going to be somewhere in here. So this is 15, this is 30, so 20 is going to be somewhere around here. So our object is going to be placed something like here. So this is the location of our object. And again, I'm just going to draw that as some arrow. And we know that our object height is equal to 1.5 centimeters. Good. Now, as we talked about yesterday, what should happen then is our image location should be somewhere greater than the radius of curvature. But let's practice drawing uh, because one of the questions on the fifth exam will involve drawing these ray diagrams. So we might as well get some more practice on how to do that. So let's draw our first two principal rays. So again, principal ray number one goes parallel to the principal, interacts with the mirror gets reflected through the focal point and then continues in a straight line. So this is principal ray number one. Principal ray number two is going to go directly through the focal point. There we go. Interact with the mirror and then go parallel to the principal. So this is ray number two. And again, where these guys cross, this is going to be the location of our image. So this should be our image location. So this should be our image. There we go. So again, our expectation is then that our image should be real. It should be inverted. 
It should also be, but have a distance which is greater than the radius of curvature. And if I compare the size of this arrow to the size of this arrow, it looks like it's also going to have a magnification which is greater than one, meaning that the size of the image should be greater than that of the actual object itself. So good. So now to determine, we're simply going to use our mirror equation. So we're going to say 1 over the object distance plus 1 over the image distance is equal to 1 over the focal length. Our sign convention says that if this is concave, then this has to be positive. So this is a positive focal length. So from here, if I want the image distance, I'm simply going to subtract this term over. So I get 1 over the image distance then is equal to 1 over the focal length minus 1 over the object distance. Now I have to invert this, so I'm going to find a common denominator, which is simply this guy times this guy. So it's going to be the same thing then as the object distance minus the focal length divided by the object distance times the focal length. So finally, this tells me that my image distance then is going to be equal to the object distance times the focal length divided by the object distance minus the focal length. So let's plug our numbers. So this now is going to become what? 20 times 15 divided by 5. So that's going to be the same thing then as what? 60. So it's going to be 60 centimeters. So this distance from the back of the mirror then should be 60 centimeters. And again, that makes sense because it's greater than the radius of curvature, which is 30. And from our drawing, this is what we should expect. So now we can calculate the magnification. So magnification then is equal to negative the image distance divided by the object distance. So in this case, it's going to be negative then of 60 divided by 15. Okay. Oh, sorry, not 15, 20. Doo -doo -doo. Object distance is 20. Sorry about that. So it should be 20. So this then should be what equal to negative 3. Okay. So magnification in this case, the negative again means that it's inverted. So this negative sign simply means it's inverted. And again, this means that it's three times the size of the actual object itself. <clears throat> so from here, we can then say, well, the magnification is also equal to the image distance divided by the object distance, which means then that the image height, or sorry, object, image height divided by the object height is then equal to the magnification times the object height. So it's going to be then equal to negative 3 times 1.5 centimeters, which means that this is then equal to negative 4.5 centimeters. Okay. Again, that negative sign just simply means that it's inverted, and then 4.5 is the actual size of it. <clears throat> Not too bad, right? Come on. Let's do another one. So I've done that one. Let's get rid of this one. So the next one is... This one says we have an external rear view uh, car mirror is convex. So now this time we're dealing with a convex mirror with a radius of curvature of 16 meters. It wants us to determine the location of the image and its magnification for an object that is 10 meters in front of the car. Okay. So let's draw that one. So in this case now we have a convex. So this guy is now this direction. So this is now our principle. Now remember for this guy, the focal point is on the opposite side, which means that if this is the radius of curvature, this is the location of the focal point. Okay. Here we're told that the radius of curvature was equal to, how much, there it is, 16 meters. So that means that the focal length then is equal to eight meters. Okay. Now, we're going to place an object 10 meters in front of this guy. Okay. So if this is 8 meters, so that would be about 8, so 10 would be something like here. So this is about 10 meters. Okay. So this is our object location. Good. So again, let's practice drawing. So again, we're going to draw principal ray number 1. So again, principal ray number 1 is going to go parallel to the principal, interact with the mirror. And again, it's going to reflect off of the mirror, oops, I kind of missed that, as if it came from the location of the focal point. So it's going to be ray number one. Ray number two, then, is going to go 
down as if it's going to pass through this focal point, but then it's going to interact with the mirror and then bounce off backwards. Okay, so this one's going to come. See if I can actually draw on this. Yeah, not too bad. I got to go, go through here. But when he interacts with the mirror, it gets reflected back from the focal point or parallel to the principal. So this is ray number two. Again, our eye is going to ray trace this guy backwards. So it's going to follow as if it came from a straight line going this way. So I'm going to ray trace backwards. So now I ray trace this line backwards, the parallel line backwards, and where the in those two guys intersect is the location of our image. So this is my image location. <clears throat> so here we can see that this is going to be virtual, which means that the image distance should be negative. Uh, it should be upright, which means magnification should be positive, and it should be smaller than the actual object itself, which means that our magnification should be less than one. Okay. So this is what we should get when we do our math here. So let's do our math. So we have one over the object distance plus one over the image distance that is equal to negative one over the focal length. Remember, this negative comes from the fact that this is a convex mirror. So anytime I'm dealing with something which is convex, the focal length is negative. So I'm gonna go ahead and insert that negative sign here just so I don't forget about it later. Good. So let's do the same thing as before. So what I want is the image distance. I'm gonna subtract this term over here. So now I get one over the image distance. Let me do it that way. Uh, let's see, let's do minus, minus one over the focal length is equal to one over the image distance. I have a negative sign here, negative sign here, so let's factor that out. So this becomes negative one over the object distance plus one over the focal length is equal to one over the image distance. Same as before, I'm gonna go ahead and find a common denominator. So I'm gonna write this as then the object distance plus the focal length divided by the object distance times the focal length with a negative sign. Finally, if I invert, I get then the image distance then is equal to negative the object distance times the focal length divided by the object distance plus the focal length. So this is gonna be equal to what? Um, so this is gonna be 10 meters times eight meters, all divided by the addition of those two, so 18 meters. Plug in our numbers, we're in this case then is, for example, three, that this should be negative 4.4 meters. Oops, I forgot my negative sign. There we go. So negative 4.4 meters. Okay. So that means this distance from here to here should be negative 4.4 meters. For magnification, we know the magnification then is equal to negative the image distance divided by the object distance. So it's gonna be a negative of a negative 4.4 divided by 10. So that means the magnification then is gonna be a positive 0 0.44. So that means it's gonna be a little less than half the size of the actual object itself. Okay, so not too bad. So good. So here, again, the thing is just to pay attention to your sign conventions. So again, whenever it's convex, you know, this has to be negative. Whenever it's concave, this has to be positive. Uh, image distance for now, or sorry, object distance for now will pretty much always be positive because it's always going to be on the same side the light is coming from. And then remember di is gonna be negative if it's on the opposite side at which the light is going to, or positive if it's on the same side at which the light is going to. So good. So that brings us to our first group assignment for today. So this says we have an object stands on a central axis, which is the principal axis of a spherical mirror. And it wants us then to simply complete this chart, okay? So in this chart, the only thing we're told is the object distance. This is 40 or whatever units this is. This could be centimeters or meters or whatever. And we're told the magnification is equal to negative 0.7. From here, we have to fill in everything else. We want to know what type of mirror is this? Is this a convex mirror or is this a concave mirror? F here is the focal length. Little r here is the radius of curvature, even though we've been using as capital R, but I stole this from a different book, so they use little r. <clears throat> uh, the image distance, this part is, is it real or virtual? So meaning, is it on the front side or the back side of the mirror? And then is this upright or inverted? But we can already know that this is inverted because of this negative sign. 
And so the negative sign means it has to be inverted. So we automatically know that this should be inverted here. So good. So basically, from only the knowledge of the object distance and the magnification, then basically fill out the rest of the chart. So shouldn't take me too long. So I'll give you, uh, I don't know, maybe about 10 minutes to kind of fill this out. Shouldn't be too bad. Uh, how many people we have today? We have one, two, I'm going to count the puppy uh, as three, <laughs> four, five, six, seven. Um, so we can do, yeah, we can do three rooms or two rooms. Okay, we'll do that. All right. Create those. Okay. <clears throat> Open all rooms. All right, how are we doing, ladies? Oh, I just asked um, if, because it is inverted, could we just assume it's real? Like, or a single one? mirror, then yes, that would be true. Okay. Um, the other way to notice that it's real is when you find the image distance. As long as the image distance is positive, then you are confirmed that it's real. Okay. Yeah. So basically the two ways will tell you. So for a single mirror, uh, that is true. So if it has a, if it's inverted, then it's real as well as, so that's only with one, but if mm -hmm. the image distance is positive, then that's real regardless of how many mirrors you have. Yeah. So since the mm -hmm. image distance is positive and the object distance is positive, can I assume that this is concave? Uh, you can assume that, uh, which you can also get by solving for the focal length. So as long as the focal length is positive, then it has to be concave. But but yes, uh, so again, for a single mirror, the only way to get a positive image distance is to have a concave mirror. That's right, because convex will always give a negative image distance. That's correct. I was headed there. I had written down like the lens equation. Mm -hmm. 
but I was like, do I need to put a negative sign there or not? But since we're solving for it, it would tell me, so. Yes, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, so if you put a negative sign in there, you would get another negative sign, meaning that it would be a negative of a negative, which gives you a positive, but yes. Yeah, that's right, that's correct, that's correct. Okay. But yeah, yeah, so the only way to get a positive image distance is with the concave, that's right. But if it was negative, then you'd have to be a little more careful because you can still get negative from a concave as well. So, yeah. So you just have to be a little bit careful with that one. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. I'll be back. All right. How are we doing, ladies? Making progress. Good. Is determining the type the last step of this problem? Um, well, you can determine it along the way, but yeah. So for example, when you solve for the focal length, as long as you know that focal length is positive or negative, that'll automatically determine what type of mirror that it is. Got it. So yeah, so that inflammation will tell you that. Um, the other thing is you can pretty much tell if your image distance is positive, then the only way to get a positive image distance from a single mirror is from a concave mirror. Oh, okay. So that's the only way, because a, a convex mirror will always give you a negative image distance, always. Now, if you get a negative image distance though, you have to be a little bit careful because you can still get a negative image distance from a concave mirror as well. So it just depends on where it's placed. So in that case, you would definitely want to check and figure out where or what the sign of the focal point is, or the focal length, but, okay. but, yeah, but, if, but if it's positive uh, image distance, the only way to get that is with a concave mirror. So then, mm -hmm. I get kind of confused on the real versus virtual. How do you know the difference? Oh, well, one way is by the image distance. So if the image distance is negative, that means it's virtual. If it's positive, that means, um, yeah, so that's probably the, the best way to go about it. So. <clears throat> and so negative means virtual, positive means real. Your puppy ran away? Yeah, he went to go take a nap. Gotcha. I could go over one of those. <laughs> well, he fights his, so. He fights his? Is that what you said? Yeah, he runs around the house for like 30 minutes before he ever goes to sleep. Sounds like my kids. <laughs> I don't want to take a nap either. <laughs> I always feel bad because a lot of times my wife will be teaching and I try to bring our daughter to take a nap and she just screams on the top of her lungs. <laughs> and of course... We, we try to get her a nap in our bed, which is right next to where the room where we teach. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> even with closed doors, she has tremendously loud lungs. So <laughs> you can hear her for a long time. <clears throat> All right, let me go check on the others. I'll be right back. Everything online, he was like, I'm going to dumb it down for you guys because this is very unexpected. <laughs> I'm like, bless you, sir. Yeah, he was awesome, for sure. Definitely. How are we doing here? Uh, I think we're done. We're done? Very good. Very nice. Okay, I think the other group is almost done. So let me check on them, and then we'll reconvene in a little bit. All right. All right, so the other group's already done. So how are we doing here? I think we're almost done. Okay. The radius would be... Twice the size of the focal length. Yeah. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and the focal length you'll just get from the uh, mirror equation since you already know the image and object distances. So. 
Yeah, so then our radius would just be 33. Yeah. And that's it. Great. All right. All right. So we'll bring everybody back. All right, welcome back everyone. So that was image formation from reflections, but now we want to start looking at image formation from refraction. So again, here we have the boundary and this is going to be in some medium one. And what we want to look at now is some sort of what? Again, incoming ray. So an incoming ray is going to strike then our boundary. And that's gonna come in at some angle theta one relative to the normal. So again, it's our normal line. So this is at a 90 degree angle to the boundary. And we're gonna start looking at what happens then to our refracted. So the transmitted portion, which goes into medium number two. So down here, we're gonna have some other medium, medium number two. <clears throat> okay. So basically what's gonna happen is dependent on how fast then the wave is gonna move with inside of the secondary medium. So this is gonna come off, let me use a different color, green, there we go. So this is gonna be refracted, it's gonna move at basically a different angle of theta two, okay? <laughs> so remember when a wave passes through some sort of boundary, remember the frequency stays the same. So the frequency stays fixed. So whatever the frequency that the light had in medium one stays exactly the same as what it is in medium two. But remember since the velocity, which in this case is the speed of, well, I'm just right, the velocity is not necessarily moving the speed of light. There we go. So remember that the velocity is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. What this means then is since the frequency is the same, that means the velocity that which it's traveling in medium one is going to be different and the wavelength in medium one will be different than what it is in medium two. Right? So basically what will happen then is as it moves from one medium to another medium, the speed at which the wave is traveling is going to be different in each of these two different mediums. Now, what dictates how fast the wave is moving inside of each one of these mediums is what's known as the index of refraction. So we looked at this in the lab, but let's talk about it again. So what's the index of refraction? So the index of refraction is that the velocity at which the object moves with inside of the medium is then equal to the speed of light divided by the index of refraction. Or this means that the index of refraction then is defined as the speed of light divided by the speed at which it moves with inside of this medium. So what exactly is this index of refraction? Well, the index of refraction is that this object is moving in different dielectrics. So basically what's happening is medium one is consistent of one dielectric. So it's gonna be dielectric number one. And medium number two is gonna consist of a secondary dielectric, which is dielectric number two. Okay. Now, what happens to the wave then when it's moving inside of the dielectric? Well here, if we can think of light as a photon instead of actually as a wave. So here I'm gonna write a photon, we call photons gamma. So what happens is the photon moves at the speed of light when it's inside of air. But once it goes inside of the dielectric, what happens is once it goes inside of the dielectric, it now moves at a slower velocity c because what we know is that the medium or the dielectric is going to polarize. So this is going to get small little tiny dipoles. These small little tiny dipoles basically are gonna create some charge distribution. So I get positive side end positive on one side, negative on the other side, and it turns out that photons, even though they have no charge, they actually couple to charge. 
<clears throat> so basically what happens then is that you create a drag force onto the photon as it's moving with inside of the medium, which effectively creates a mass on the photon. So photons are actually massless by definition, but when it moves inside of the medium due to this drag force, due to the coupling between the uh, charged particles and the photon itself, it turns out that the gamma ends up creating a mass which is then greater than zero. So that then affects the photon itself, causing the photon to feel a drag force, which causes it to move not as fast with inside of the dielectric material. <clears throat> this is one way to think about it. Another way to think about it <clears throat> is that the dipoles here actually create an electric field. The light which is moving in it is an oscillating electric and magnetic field so what ends up happening is you get a superposition between the electric field of the dipole moments and that of the electric field itself which then reduces the total electric field which then reduces the speed at which it travels so whichever way you want to kind of think about it either as a photon which is creating a drag force onto it gaining an effective mass so it moves much slower than the speed of light or then it's a superposition of electric fields Either one is fine, whichever way you kind of want to think about it. But the overall effect, it's all we really care about, is that it moves at a slower rate. Okay, so the, the speed at which it moves is going to be much slower. Now it turns out that the index of refraction is actually frequency dependent. So this is actually angular frequency dependent, which basically means that the index of refraction on different colors of lights is going to behave differently. So it has a different number associated with different colors. <laughs> this is actually what gives us a rainbow. So a rainbow is actually white light, white light from the sun, which is the superposition of all possible different frequencies. So there's red in there, blue, green, yellow, indigo, et cetera, ultraviolet, gamma rays, all kinds of different stuff. So what happens is actually as the light goes through the air and then enters into a rain droplet, when it enters a rain droplet, you get a dispersion of the different colors because each color now is moving at a different rate due to the fact that they all have different index of refractions. So this is the same thing that happens with the prism. So if you took a prism and you actually shine a light onto it, you'll see that separation of the colors. It's gonna create that rainbow. So in this case, the light goes in, you get a dispersion of the colors. Each one actually separates. They go and they hit the back of the water droplet. In that case, some of them are refracted through, some of it's gonna be reflected. As they get reflected, they actually cross each other and then they're going to be refracted out through the other side of the wing droplets and then move towards you and this is actually what gives you the rainbow. Okay. <clears throat> so it turns out that violet is actually the least amount of, um, is that true? So let's see here. Yeah, violet is gonna be the least uh, which it is, no, I'm trying to remember, no, red, sorry. Red is gonna be the least at which it is actually <clears throat> bent. Uh, violet is the most, which is actually why you see the rainbow separated in this case and the direct colors at which you see it into. Sorry about that, kind of confused myself there for a minute. So right, so this is the next refraction. So basically how this ray is then going to be bent either toward or away from the normal is going to depend on the ratio then of the index refractions from the first medium. So the first medium is going to have an index refraction of N1, and the second medium then is going to have an index refraction of N2. So how it bends from going across this boundary is dictated by what's known as Snell's law. This is what we used in lab. So what Snell's law says is that the index refraction of medium one times sine of the incident angle theta one is then equal to the index refraction N two times sine of the bent angle theta two. <laughs> so ultimately this tells me that N one over N two then is equal to sine of theta two divided by sine of theta one. So let's look at some possible scenarios. So if we go from N1 greater than N2, meaning if we go from a high index refraction to a low index refraction, what happens in this case then is this becomes what? Bigger than one. So that means N1 divided by N2. So N1 is bigger than N2, which means this number is gonna be greater than one. So this number then has to also be greater than one. For this number to be greater than one, <coughs> 
what happens? Well, sine is going to be greater for larger angles. So what I need is for this guy to be bigger than this guy, which means that theta two then has to be greater than theta one. So if n one is greater than n two, what happens then is theta two must be greater than theta one, which means that what? If it goes from a high index refraction to a low index refraction, the ray gets bent away from the normal. So this is gonna be bent away from the normal. If it goes from a low index refraction to a high index refraction, so basically the opposite, so if n2 is greater than n1, in this case, what has to be true is that theta one must be greater than theta two, which means it's actually gonna be bent toward the normal. <clears throat> So in this case, if we go from low to high, this is gonna be bent away from the normal. But if we go from high to low, actually no, I had that backwards, sorry about that. <clears throat> so if I go from high to low, and yeah, my brain's not working today. <laughs> so if we go from high to low, there we go. So if we go from high to low, then it gets bent away from the normal. And if we go from low to high, then it gets bent toward the normal. There we go. So low to high. So index of refraction and the fact that light moves at different rates gives us all kinds of interesting optical effects. So for example, if we're looking at things which are placed in the water, it gives us these kind of false images of this object. So here, the toothbrush seems like it's actually split into multiple pieces. Here, the pencil looks like it's bent, also kind of split, so bends in a different direction. Here, as well as the spoon, we can also see the colors are shifted in different directions. Uh, this is actually what causes mirages as well. So a mirage is <clears throat> by the fact that the index refraction in a place that's hot is different than the index refraction in a place that's colder. So what actually happens is as the light is coming down from the sun, it's much hotter near the surface of the earth than it is up in the upper atmosphere. So as it goes downward, the index refraction is actually changing, which causes the light to bend. So you'll actually see something over here, the light gets bent and then comes into your eye. So you ray trace it backwards and you find it at a different location than what it should be. So basically what's happening here is the light, which is coming from inside of the water, comes out and then gets bent away because the water is at a higher index refraction than that of air. So the light rays which are coming out from the water get bent at a much sharper angle. Your eye then sees it here, tries to ray trace it backwards and finds it at a different location than where it actually originated from. So this is what causes these different optical effects. So if you see somebody in a pool, you see their legs much shorter than they actually are. You'll see things being bent. This is what gives us mirages, all kinds of different things. It's because of this difference in the index of refraction. And again, our eye is very stupid. It tries to always trace things back in a straight line at where it actually came from in this ray tracing. <clears throat> so good. So let's use this and let's do an example. So this example says that we have a swimmer has dropped their goggles at the bottom of a pool at the shallow end, which is one meter deep. But the goggles don't look to be one meter deep, they look to be something else. So we wanna know how deep do the goggles actually look? What is the apparent depth of these goggles? So let's draw what's going on here. So let's say here's the bottom of the pool. Here are my goggles, draw that as an infinity. There's my goggles, great. Here is the swimmer. So she's standing here. And then she's gonna look down to see her goggles. Okay. And let's say the water is somewhere here, the shallow end. And we know the actual height at which this is, is one meter. So let's call that H, okay. so the actual height. Now, the swimmer is not going to see them at one meter deep. She's going to see them at some other height, H prime. Let's talk about why that is. So what's happening here is light from here is gonna come out. It's going to then strike the top of the water at some incident angle relative to the normal, and let's call that theta one, okay? 
From there, it's now going to, via Snell's law, bend away then from the normal because it's going from a high index refraction to a low index refraction. So it's gonna come out here into the swimmer's eye at a new angle relative to the normal, where this is now theta two, okay? The swimmer then is going to ray trace this line backwards and see where this is going to intersect, which is going to be at this height here. So she's going to see it at this apparent height h prime. So what we want to know then is what is h prime? So how high does she actually see this thing to be? Okay. It's okay. Now what I also know is that this angle here is the same as the external angle here. So this is actually theta two. Okay. So basically what we're doing is we're building two different triangles. So let's draw the green triangle. So we have one triangle that looks like this. Let me redraw that there you go. down this way here, where we know this height here is H. This is the angle theta one. <clears throat> and this is gonna be some distance X, okay? Then we're building a secondary one. Let's draw it in red, which is now here. This distance is still X. Okay, but this is now coming over at a different angle. So that this is now theta two, but this is still X and this is H prime, okay? So that these two distances of X are the same. So from this, we want to determine what is H prime. <laughs> so first things first, we know that using Snell's law that we can relate theta one to theta two using Snell's law. So let's talk about Snell's law. So Snell's law says that index refraction from the first, which is then n water, times sine of theta one must be equal to then n air times then sine of theta two. Now n water is about 1.33, and then n air is equal to one. Okay. So that means I'm just gonna set this equal to one and drop it. So it's gonna be simply equal to sine of theta two. Okay. So this is now gonna give me a relationship between theta one and theta two. Okay. Now, the other thing I know is that what? Since I have this triangle here and I know the adjacent side and the opposite side, I have this triangle here, which I know the opposite side and the adjacent side, we know that these are also related by tangents, right? So we can also say that tangents of theta one is equal to what? Opposite side, which is X. Into that angle. So the opposite side divided by H and then tangent of theta two is equal to its opposite side, which is also X divided then by H prime. Okay. <clears throat> Now here, I'm probably, I'm gonna use a trick that none of you have ever probably used before. Uh, I'm gonna somewhat justify it, but not too much. <laughs> so, so it turns out that if theta one and theta two are small, so basically meaning as long as X here is somewhat small, so the angle at which this is coming out at is pretty small, then it turns out that tangent of the angle theta one is approximately equal to sine of theta one and tangent of theta two is approximately then equal to sine of theta two. Okay. Now, the way I'm gonna justify this is I'm gonna say, go ahead and try using your calculator and see how that works. Okay. So do something like sine of 0 0.01 and tangent of 0 0.01 and you'll find out you'll actually get the same thing. Okay. Um, mathematically, the way this works is from something from calc two, um, so if you've never taken Calc 2 before, don't worry too much about it, but it's what's known as a Taylor series. So you would actually do a Taylor series expansion for each one of these and find the Taylor series is actually the same. But I don't think any of you actually have to take Calc 2, so I'm not gonna talk too much about that. So anyways, so what? So basically all this means is that we're gonna replace these things here. So that means this is approximately equal to sine of theta one, and this is approximately equal then to sine of theta two which means I'm gonna replace sine of theta one here with X over H, and I'm gonna replace sine of theta two with an X over H prime. So this is now gonna become N water times then X divided by H is then equal to X divided by H prime. Okay. 
Now this x is the same as this x, so we can cancel those out. So finally, we're going to get then is that h prime then is going to be equal to what? h divided by n water. Right. So 1.33, that's actually the same thing as what? Um, four thirds, right? So this is going to be the same thing then as one meter divided by four thirds, which is the same thing as three fourths of a meter, which is then 0 0.75 meters. Okay. So the apparent depth that she sees her goggles is actually at three quarters of a meter as opposed to a meter. So this is Snell's law. Now, one interesting thing about Snell's law is it turns out that for different angles, there is eventually an angle at which you're going to reach, which doesn't allow for transmission of light through this medium anymore. So let's say that, for example, again, I have some sort of light source down here. So let's say this is a laser or something. This is some sort of light source. This is a light source. This is in an X refraction of say N1, and I want it to go to N2. <clears throat> but let's say for now N2 is simply equal to, ah, I'll leave it this way. So let's leave it to N2. Okay. So let's talk about this. Now, the only thing I do know is that we're going to go from a high index refraction to a low index refraction. So what will happen again is that this thing is going to be bent away from the normal. So we're going to say N1 then is greater than N2. Okay. So basically what will happen is, let's say I send one light ray coming this way, so that this interacts at an angle of theta one relative to the normal, so that the refracted ray is gonna bend away and do something like this. So this is gonna come off at an angle of theta two. But now if I keep increasing the size of this initial angle, so now if I put this guy, say, out here, what will happen then is eventually I'm going to reach a point where this refracted ray is going to move parallel to the surface. So meaning that this angle here, theta one is going to become what's called theta critical. And then this refracted ray is going to move along the surface of this medium. Okay. So that's the angle at which it is refracted at is exactly to 90 degrees. So as this angle here is going to increase, this is going to be bent more and more and more and more towards the normal until eventually for this angle of theta critical, the refracted ray then is only going to move along the surface of this boundary. So at the interference between the two, so that it's going to be at a 90 degree angle. Okay. Now, if I have now a ray which goes at an angle even greater than this theta critical, okay, so let me call this angle here, So this angle now theta one, or this angle theta one greater than theta critical, what will happen then is there's going to be no refracted ray. We're only going to get reflections. So now I'm going to get a reflected ray, which goes on the inside, which goes in at that same angle theta one. This is what's called total internal reflection. So total internal reflection occurs when your angle theta one becomes greater than this critical angle, which is then the angle at which this moves relative or only along the line between the, the two mediums or along this boundary, okay? So total internal reflection means that there's no part of the ray which is actually being refracted outward. Everything is only being reflected towards the inside, okay? So let's talk about theta critical. So here we have n1 times sine of theta critical must then be equal to n2 times sine of 90, but again, sine of 90 is simply equal to one. So it's gonna be then n2. So theta critical then is gonna be equal to the inverse sine of then the ratio of n2 to n1. So this is now gonna be what's called theta critical. 
So again, theta critical is the angle at which the light goes relative to the normal, which is going to lead to a refracted ray, which only goes along the surface of the boundary. Again, this is our boundary. So for different index refractions, then we then have different critical angles. So again, any angle, which is then greater than this critical angle, theta critical, leads to only internal, internal reflection. Total internal reflection. So there is zero refracted rays. So that means, for example, if you were standing somewhere out here trying to see something in the water, you would never be able to see it. And the reason for that is because the light, which is then reflecting off of the object, will then hit and only be reflected totally internally with inside of the medium itself. So if you were trying to see, for example, your sunglasses that you dropped in the water, or a ring or an earring or anything else that you dropped in the water, if you are standing at a distance too far away, which is then greater than the angle at which would give you this critical angle, you would never be able to see the object. None of the light rays coming from that object would ever be able to go into your eye. So this is what's called total internal reflection. Total internal reflection is used all the time in things like fiber optics. Fiber optics. So in fiber optics, basically what you do is you take a whole bunch of little tiny tubes. So fiber optics is created from all these little tubes. So each one of these tubes, say, go in this direction. And what you do is you basically are sending information via light, where that light is actually coming in, but it's coming in at an angle greater than the theta critical. So that way, when it goes inside of one of these tubes, it's only going to experience total internal reflection the entire time. So the information, which is then going along the light ray, which is now being driven down by this fiber optic, is only experiencing total internal reflection, which means zero of the information is being lost due to refraction going to the exterior. So a lot of things, what happens is, again, with information, you're losing a lot of information if a lot of that light is being refracted to the outside because the intensity of the light is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so eventually you're going to lose all that information due to refraction. But here with fiber optics, it uses this total internal reflection so that way none of the light gets refracted. So 100% of the information and 100% of the intensity gets delivered to wherever it is that you want it to go. So great. That's about as much as I want to talk about with that. So good. So the next thing we're going to talk about is... So now we talked about refraction. We now want to talk about image formation from refraction, which basically means we want to start talking about things that I'm wearing, glasses, so lenses. In particular, we're going to talk about thin lenses. So thin lenses work from refraction of lights. So let's just talk about a lens, for example. So let's say here's my lens. I'm going to draw an overly large size lens that kind of point out the difference between a thick lens and a thin lens. So this is going to be a thick lens. Let's talk about the difference. <laughs> so the thick lens, so basically, again, we're going to have some principal axis. The principal axis is going to bisect the line here. So this is our principal axis. So bisects the lens itself. And here what we're going to do is we're going to send light parallel to the principal axis. So this is my incoming light. Okay. So what happens inside of a thick lens? What happens inside of a thick lens is we have to abide by Snell's law. So basically what's going to happen is this light ray is going to interact with the lens here. But then Snell's law tells us that there's going to be some perpendicular here. So let me draw my perpendicular. So this is going to be coming in at an angle of theta 1. Okay. Now, across Snell's law, or across the boundary here, so let's draw my normal on the other side. So this is going from, say, air into something which has a higher index refraction, which means it's going to bend towards the normal. So this is now going to be bent 
say something like this, so it's going to be bent towards the normal. So this is going to be bent something like here. So I get a refraction across here. So this is going to be, say, theta 2. Then it's going to interact with this boundary here. So again, I'm going to have a normal line here and extend my normal line across on this side. So this is now going to be impingent on this side at an angle of, say, theta 3. But now again, I'm going from a high index refraction to a low index refraction, which means it's going to be bent away from the normal which means that finally this thing is going to be bent somewhere outward and is going to pass through here where it's going to go from theta four. But again, what I know is, you know what it does that? So here I know that theta one is going to be what? Greater than theta two and that theta four is going to be greater than theta three. So this is actually what happens inside of a thick lens. So inside of a thick lens, what's true is that this has some thickness to it. Let's call this a thickness of T. It also has a radius of curvature, R. So a thick lens is defined by the fact that the thickness is around the same size then as the radius of curvature. So here you get multiple applications of Snell's law. So you get Snell's law across this boundary, Snell's law across this boundary. So the path that the light is following takes different paths as it's going through the lens. Okay. For a thin lens, a thin lens is defined by the fact that the thickness of the lens is much, much less than the radius of curvature. So basically here, you're now dealing with something that looks like this. Oops, a bit better. So that the thickness across here, T, is much, that's great, much smaller than that of the radius of curvature. So basically what happens inside of a thin lens, so we still have our principal axis, so it's still gonna be the line that bisects the lens. So this is still our principal. But what happens inside the thin lens is even though this intermediate portion here, this blue line that I drew, is still occurring, but it, the rate at which it occurs or the distance at which it occurs over is very, very small. Which basically means that what's going on here is the distance between where this light ray comes in versus where it comes out here is something substantial. Here with the thin lens, it's actually very, very small, very, very minute. So with a thin lens, since the thickness is very small compared to the radius of curvature, the deviation of the light ray with inside the lens itself is minute. It's very small, okay? So because of that, we basically ignore the deviation of the light ray with inside of the lens itself. So for thin lenses, we can ignore the deviation of the path of the light ray, <clears throat> unlike that of the thick lens. So even though that deviation exists, it's basically minute and it doesn't really do anything and so it's not going to deviate the path that much. So basically for a thin lens, what we're going to pretend is that the light is not going to be deviated anywhere going from the boundary to the center. So basically all we're going to say then in this case is the light ray is going to come in, hit the center of the lens. By the time it gets to the center of the lens, it is then going to be refracted this way. Okay, so this is what we're going to pretend with a thin lens. So basically whatever deviation happened inside of the lens, we're just going to ignore it. So this is thin lenses. Basically, it's just going to simplify our calculations as much as possible. Okay, so we're going to only look at thin lenses then. We're going to ignore this thick lens. Okay. So look, so thin lenses. Now, as we saw in lab, in general, we have two different types of thin lenses. So we have what's known as a converging lens. And we have what's known as a diverging lens. So converging lens, we're typically just gonna draw something like this. So this is my converging lens. And for a diverging lens, we're typically gonna draw something more like this. So this is my diverging lens. Okay. So what's the difference between the two? Well, the difference is, is if I take light 
and I send it parallel to the principal here, basically what will happen is again, by the time it reaches the center of the lens, each one of these guys will be refracted and they're gonna be refracted to a single point. So this ray is gonna get refracted through here. This one will get refracted through here. This one will get refracted through here. This one will go something like this. And then this one will be bent even more. So this is our converging lens. So the converging lens is gonna take all this light, focus it to a single point, where that single point again is what we call the focal point. So F here is the focal point. Now we talked about this in lab, but I said is that this would be like a magnifying glass where you could hold up the magnifying glass to the sun. And then all that light would be concentrated to a single point, which allows you to then kill and fry ants if you want to. So if you're hungry, you can bake an ant, right? And then eat that, so life would be great. Okay. So this is what we call a converging lens. A diverging lens, what happens in that case, again, is if I send lights parallel to the principal. So what happens in this case then is the light actually diverges outward, so it spreads out but it spreads out as if it all came from a single point on the backside of the lens. So what'll happen is this right here, this point, this one will diverge outward this way. Uh, this one will diverge out this way. Uh, this one will actually just keep moving straight. This one will diverge out like this. And then this one will diverge out this way. Okay. So basically what will happen then is all these light rays spread out, but they spread out as if they came from a single point, which again is what's called the focal point. So for the lens, this has a focal point on the back side. This one has a focal point on the front side. Okay. So these are our two different types of lenses. Now, I'll talk more about this in a little bit, but it turns out that for now, we're not going to care about the radius of curvature, but it turns out that we can have different radii of curvature on each side. So this one can have a different radius than this one. Uh, same thing over here, this one can have a different radius. We'll talk about that, that's what's known as the lens maker equation, but we'll get there soon enough. So good, so let's talk about image formation from each one of these. So let's look at first our converging lens. So here we have our different image formations. So say this has a focal point here and a focal point, extend that a little bit better. Uh, what I do now is about two over, so about here. So this is my focal point. So let's look at our different image or different rays that we're gonna draw in this case. So again, let's put in our object. So here is our object. Okay, so this is my object. So in this case, ray number one is going to be similar to what we did last time. So what will happen is that the light is going to go parallel to the principal. It's going to go to the center of the lens. Once it reaches the center of the lens, it's then going to be refracted down through the focal point and then continue moving on straight. The second one then, ray number two. So ray number two we're going to draw, it's going to go through the focal point on the near side. So whichever focal point is closer go into the center of the lens. When it reaches the center of the lens, it's then gonna be refracted parallel to the principal. So it's gonna move out this way, okay? So that's ray number two. Ray number three is going to be the ray which goes through the center of the lens but gets no refraction and then just keeps moving straight. So this guy's gonna come in through here. Oops, I missed that a little bit. There we go, through here and then continue moving straight. So this one has zero refraction. So that's ray number three. Uh, the location where all three of these guys overlay with each other is going to be the location of the image. So our image location then is going to be this. Okay. So let's define some things. So the distance from the center of the lens to the location of the object is what's called the object distance. The distance from the center of the lens to the focal point is what's called the focal length. So each one of these guys is actually the focal length. And then the distance from the center of the lens 
to the location where the image is created. That's then the image distance. So this is for a converging lens. Now again, just like with mirrors, only two of these are sufficient most of the time. So you don't have to draw all three. You can just draw two of these, whichever two that you like the best. Right. Uh, so let's look at a diverging lens. So what happens in that case? So here's my diverging lens. Here's our principal. So again, we're gonna have focal point on each side. So it'll be a focal point here and then same distance on this side. So that's what, one, two, and a little bit. So one, two, and a little bit. So this is my focal point. And again, let's put in some sort of object. So this is my object. Okay. So again, basically it's gonna work the same way. So ray number one is going to go through here. Okay, so it's gonna go parallel to the principal, reach the center of the lens. But again, what happens in this case then is what? <laughs> it's not going to be bent towards this focal point. It's going to diverge away as if it came from this near side focal point. So I'm gonna draw a dotted line to here and then continue this guy out in this direction. Okay, so this is gonna be ray number one. Skip ray number two for now and go to ray number three. So ray number three is gonna be the same. It's gonna go through the center, but continue on straight as if it's not going to diverge away at all. So it's just gonna pass straight through. So it's gonna be ray number three. Ray number two is then going to do what? So ray number two, instead of trying to go through this front one, it's going to try to go through this front one here, but then by the time it passes through the center, it's gonna go parallel to the principal. So let me draw that here. So this one, instead of going through this front focal point like it did on the converging lens, we're gonna actually try to go through the back focal points because that's the actual focal point. So we're gonna come through here as if it's going to go through this focal point, but instead it's going to but, refract parallel to the principal. So this one's gonna go off in this direction. So that's this guy. So this is ray number two. Now again, our eye is gonna be somewhere out here. So this is the location of our eye. So our eye is gonna see this one moving this way and it's going to ray trace it backwards. So now we gotta ray trace this guy backwards parallel to the principal. So this is my ray traced line backwards. So the location of the image then is going to be the location where the ray traced line going backwards from ray one, the ray traced line going backwards from ray two, and the actual line from ray three all intersect with each other, which is gonna be at this point here. So this is gonna be the location of the image. So this will be my image location. Is okay. So these are our ray diagrams for converging lenses and then diverging lenses. <clears throat> so we actually want to know mathematically where this stuff actually is formed. So this is what we have the thin lens equation. So we already saw this in lab, but the thin lens equation says that one over the object distance plus one over the image distance is then equal to one over the focal length and the magnification. M is equal to, again, the image height divided by the object height, which is then equal to minus the image distance divided by the object distance. Okay. So notice that the thin lens equation and the magnification are exactly the same as that of the mirror equation and the lateral magnification. All of these are actually the same, so we can actually do both mirrors and lenses using exactly the same equations. Uh, this goes again with sign conventions. So let's write down sign conventions. Sign convention number one, uh, focal length is positive for a converging lens, negative for a diverging lens. Uh, number two, uh, object distance is positive if on the same side that light 
is coming from negative otherwise. Number three, image distance is positive if on the same sign that light is going to negative otherwise. Uh, four, magnification is positive if upright, negative if inverted. Good, so let's talk about some of these things. So let's go back to our pictures here. So first things first, here, this object distance is positive. Uh, this is positive because this is on the same side the light is coming from. So in this case, the, front, the light is moving from left to right. So this is a positive object distance. <coughs> this is also a positive image distance because the light is continuing to move through the lens via refraction. So in this case, it's moving in this direction. So it's still moving from left to right. So this is on the same side at which the light is going to, so this is a positive image distance. Okay. This would be a negative magnification because this is inverted. Okay. Here, this is still a positive object distance, but the difference here is that this distance here, which is now the image distance, is now a negative image distance. So we now have a negative image distance because it's on the opposite side at which the light is going to. So the light is still moving left to right. It continues to move left to right. So in this case, this is going to be a negative image distance because it's on the opposite side at which the light is going to. This focal point or this focal length will also be negative. So in this case, I have a negative focal length with a negative image distance. And this would be a positive magnification because it is upright. Okay. So it's a little bit backwards from that of the mirrors. Because the mirror is if we found the image distance over here, this was positive. Where if we found it over here, that was negative. In this case, it's opposite. So we look at the direction where the light is going to. So remember, it's passing through the lens. So the light continues to move in this direction. Because again, my eye is over here. So I'm looking at which the direction at which the light is going to, which in this case is on this side. Okay. So this is positive. So in this case, this one is positive. In this case, this one is negative. So these are lenses. So I think we have time to do one short example. So let's do a short example. So let's look at not that one. We're going to do that one. Example number five. Good. So this says, what is A, the position, and B, the size of the image of a leaf placed pardon me, one meter in front of a 50 millimeter focal length camera lens. Okay. So a camera lens is actually going to be a converging lens. So in this case, we're dealing with a converging lens. So here we're going to have a converging lens. So here's our converging lens. In this case, we know the focal length is equal to 50 millimeters. So that means our focal point here is about here, and this focal point, say, is here. Okay. Now we're gonna take a leaf, where that leaf then is here. So I'm just gonna draw as an arrow. There's my leaf, great. And we know this distance, which is our object distance, is going to be D object, which is equal to one meter. And we know this has a height, uh, H object, which was what, 7.6 centimeters, I think. Good. So from here, we wanna know then is what, again, what is the image distance? What is that equal to? And we also want to know what is the image height? So same thing as before. <clears throat> so good. So let's practice drawing our ray diagrams just for funsies. So here, again, we're going to draw principal ray number one. That's going to go parallel to the principal. And then it gets refracted down through the focal point. And there we go. So it's going to go off in this direction. Uh, and I'm also going to draw number two. So number two is going to go down through focal point on the front side, hit the center of the lens, and then gets refracted parallel to the principal. 
the location of where these guys are going to intersect is then the image location. Okay, so this should be my image. So that this distance here should be my image distance. So from here, what we should see then is that what? This is a real image because the light is actually passing through it. So it's gonna be a real image because the image distance we should find to be positive. The magnification should be negative since it should be inverted. Okay. And we should find that the absolute value of the image height should be less than that of the object height. So this is what we should find. <clears throat> so good. So let's do this. So number one, we have Lens equation, which says one over the object distance plus one over the image distance is equal to one over the focal length. This is, is a converging lens, so this guy is going to be positive. So this says that our image distance then is going to be the object distance times the focal length divided by the object distance minus the focal length. So this is going to be one meter times 0 0.05, because it's 50 millimeters, divided by one minus 0 0.05. So plug in our numbers, we find in this case then is the position turns out to be 5.26 centimeters. Okay. So this works out to be 5.26 centimeters. Okay. Part B, magnification we know is equal to negative of the image distance divided by the object distance. So this is going to be negative 5.26 divided by 100 because we have 100 centimeters in one meter. So it's going to be 0 0.0526. Right? I did that right, right? Yeah, okay. Um, good. So that means that the image height is then going to be, oh, for my negative side, there we go. So it's going to be negative 0 0.0526 times then 7.6 centimeters, right? So assuming I multiply this guy out right, uh, this should be about negative 0 0.4 centimeters. I think I multiplied that. Okay, assuming I did. So this is gonna be then our image height. It's okay. So again, same thing as with the mirror. So uh, tomorrow we'll start off with another example. And then we'll move on from there. Uh, so then after that, I have a couple group assignments for you and then we'll talk about combinations of lenses and then what happens if my lenses have different uh, radii. So that'll bring us to what's known as the lens maker equation. And then we'll be done. Tomorrow's what, Thursday? So, so we'll probably do the same thing we did last time. So we'll just do the example, talk about the uh, combination of lenses and we'll talk about lens maker equation. We'll do a review and then I'll let you guys work on the group assignments uh, from there with the remaining amount of time. So, uh, so good. So anybody have any questions on these? Like I said, it's pretty much exactly the same thing as the lens or the mirror equations, but just slightly different, but not too bad. Was okay. Happy and cheery on a dreary day. Great. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, otherwise, then I'll see. So, no lab today. So, hopefully, I'll get all of your exam stuff graded tonight. So that way, I'll have a good answer for where your grades are going in until tomorrow. So, if you want to ask questions about that uh, tomorrow to see if you want to take the fifth exam or not, then ask away tomorrow. So, I should be all set with all that stuff. All right, so I'll see everybody tomorrow.